I'm going to order some of the Ilford Ortho, which has just come out also. You know cool. This? Yeah, Ortho, that, yeah, that, that'll probably lead us right into our topic of the day. I'm already rolling. This is, uh, no, it is the 3rd of August, 2024. I'm Chris, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Here we go. We're back with hello, hello. another hello. podcast. I, I decided to jump right into this discussion. And Why not? Kick this off. Um, how's everyone doing? We're doing well. Not bad. Not, not bad. bad. Considering. Not hey, that's, considering. That's pretty good. No, no, come on. I'm British, right? Not bad is actually right up, way up there, right? Yeah. When, I, when I lived in Ireland for a while, the usual answer was not too bad, not too bad. Yeah, you know when things twice. are really bad. You know that things are really bad in Ireland when they say it's grand. <laughs> it's just like, oh no, it's not that bad, is it? Uh. All right, we have an episode on infrared photography, of all things. Um, and Jeremiah, you're the one who triggered this. Why? I, I know. Why on Which earth? Was, you know, uh, possibly it's because I wanted to uh, learn from you guys <laughs> because uh, having shot um, infrared for many, many years, uh, infrared film with various filters and have a converted camera, which I have used and done some editing in Photoshop in terms of flipping the colors and adjusting the hues and whatnot. I do not consider myself in any way, shape, or form an expert, even a experienced intermediate. Uh, I can say that I've done it, um, but I don't have a lot of control over it. And yet, I find myself drawn to it. And so, um, just you know, this past week, um, possibly just to refresh my sensibilities and to kind of uh, move away from my AI investigations. Um, though I'm sure I'll circle back with the finished edits. <laughs> um, I, I, I thought I would uh, just open this up for a wider discussion because um, it is a fascinating uh, look at what the eye sees, what it doesn't see, what film sees, what it doesn't see, how to filter various colors, um, and explore the world in a, a somewhat different um, look and feel. So while one might kind of run away from certain nature compositions, with infrared, I think you're always looking for how surreal uh, one could change, especially chlorophyll-based uh, nature, um, just the way it, 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 it kind of reflects uh, their wavelengths. And right. um, there are several um, companies that do conversions. Um, and by conversions, it, it, you know, I, I mean that you take your camera and you create a permanent infrared uh, filter back actually they remove um it's like so let me ahead. let me let me try to let, to kind of technically define uh, infrared photography uh, for for a minute please, because that please will do. probably please help do. so <laughs> so we have a we have a light spectrum it goes from anywhere in the ultraviolet into through blue and green and yellow into red and then in infrared which is uh infrared is outside of what we can see so making that visible is probably it makes it makes things look different everyone who's seen infrared photos makes things look different and then what is typically typically done is because the uh because digital cameras filter infrared light out they have a filter in front of the sensor that's the conversion so you take that filter out you replace it with just a pane of glass pretty much and then the camera has an extended range it it looks beyond uh, your visible range into the infrared and then what was was often done is you take an additional filter on the lens that blocks out anything that is red or uh, other parts of the visible spectrum. So you make the camera only see the infrared. And you mentioned shooting with film. With film, it's fairly easy because film doesn't come with an infrared filter on it. So 
if you have a if you have a, a film stock that is very sensitive in the infrared spectrum um then you just put one of these blocking filters on and you get only the infrared spectrum on the film but with a digital camera you need this additional modification most of the time to take out that filter so but modifying a camera as you said is a permanent thing right the camera is is open yeah. to the infrared forever That's right. there, there's no there's no whoops <laughs> i made a mistake right no you're you're in it <laughs> And, uh, but I took a camera that I didn't use that often, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, 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 you know, a three quarter, um, Lumix and, and, um, I was so happy with the conversion. I think Kolari did it. Um, so, so it's a, it's a company you send it to, you tell them what kind of a conversion you want and then they yeah. do all I did the... full spectrum because I wanted the mo most, uh, control. Uh, based on secondary filters. So that um, means they open it up and then you have to block out whatever you want blocked that's out. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you use it, generally you use it with, with a filter. Um, and we could talk about those filters in a bit. But uh, I thought that what was, what's interesting about infrared is more um, metaphysical uh, because, you know, we are used to seeing the world. We look at a tree, plant life, and we go, that's green. And we think that green, that is reality. But that's a subjective reality to how human vision and light and our brain interpret that. And we can all kind of more or less agree, though we all see green in a slightly different way. Um, I had my cataracts done last year, and when they were done, the green was much more vivid, um, it w and it tended a little bit towards the blue. Um, compared to before, which was a little bit yellow because of the haze of the lens. Um, all this is meant to say that when you look at things through an infrared sensibility, you go like, oh, those leaves are orange, or those leaves are white, or those leaves are red. And we think, oh, that's surrealistic. That's weird. It's unreal. But in fact... It's as real as anything else. It's just the way um, we are able to see, like many animals can hear in very, very high um, frequencies. Well, you know, we can't. And as we age, that those frequencies narrow. Um, it's just a way of, of kind of looking at the world in a different way and, and in many ways just questioning how we see reality to begin with. And, and I think also when you divvy it up into color and black and white, additional um, image possibilities um, kind of emerge and a different way of seeing emerges. And, and, you know, all this goes to kind of use photography as a way of questioning reality, of understanding reality and uh, uh, understanding the way we subjectively interact with um, our own vision. So I think that's that is really kind of the philosophical underbelly here. It's it's a it's a bit akin to just black and white photography yeah. versus the way we see the world in color. So that's that's it's right. an abstraction, a different kind of abstraction of what we see there. That's right. Uh, in fact, in one of my my uh, art tomes, um, you know, our, our artist statement, I, I I said that if you look at a you know a, a, a a portrait by Rembrandt um, in all its fine detail, lighting, and color, uh, we go, oh, that's a, a really extraordinary painting. Whereas we look at a Ansel Adams photo um, of Yosemite, we go like, oh, that's, that's, a, that's real, even though his work is very, very darkroom oriented, burning, dodging, etc and the abstraction of black and white relative to the color of Rembrandt and the detail. So in, 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 w in the way I see it, I mean, the Rembrandt is more realistic portrayal of what we consider reality and Ansel Adams much less, more abstract. And, and I, I think that's something that as we have become used to photography as representing quote reality, unquote, um, the, the whole aesthetic of photography is based on the assumption of reality. And that's why with AI, things start to get a little more confusing. 
By the way, there, there's Groucho, a lot in there to I, unpick, I, isn't can there? Can I deliver I'd... a quote by uh, Groucho Marx? For, sure. Because we're talking sure. about reality. <laughs> he, Groucho Marx said that um, he was not fond of reality, he didn't like reality, but uh, at the, the end of the day, it's the only place to get a decent meal. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting because it, infrared photography i i don't it is real right in the sense that what it's seeing it is yeah what the camera is reacting to is the emission of electromagnetic waves uh or the reflection off of, yeah reflection off the off the whatever it is you point the camera at right it, it happens to be slightly outside the range that we not we humans normally see but i'm totally with you on the eyes thing i mean i i had one eye done right i had one cataract done and now i have eyes with different white balances yeah. right and different frequency responses so how so long the, the, did it take your brain to adapt so you don't notice that anymore so we have talked about, I forget which show this is, because when this was a couple of years ago, right, when I had it done and we talked about it, it was roughly, I think you, 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 I was at 80, 90% there after about six weeks. It was mm -hmm. quite an experience watching Agree. your yeah. brain reprogram itself, watch, yeah. watching from the inside your brain reprogram itself to see. Um, uh, but I still see, um, I still have, it's a cooler white balance with, with the eye that I had operated on. Uh, and I can see greater frequencies and not infrared, actually the other end, <laughs> I can see more into the UV um with with my with my plastic eye with my bionic eye, if you like, uh, than I can with my natural eye. Um, even to the point where if you go to somewhere where they use UV, you know, like sort of you know, glow in the dark disco lighting kind of places. I first noticed it in a bowling alley that thought it was a discotheque. Right. Uh, and I say discotheque very much tongue in cheek. Right. It was a really old fashioned looking place. It wasn't. Yeah. But but they had it was like painted black, but there was all this glow in the dark paint and, and stuff like that. And I thought that's a bit weird. I can see the lights. Right. That the, I mean, yeah, I can see the dark lights. I was like, how is that? how is that a thing and i realized i could only see the dark light with one eye right with one eye it was dark and then the eye that i'd had fixed it was it was actually visible so so i'd say right that infrared photography is definitely is very definitely a reflection of reality i know i'm picking up on only like one thin strand in everything you said jeremiah but it's just <laughs> but I, yeah. I it was the same it was the same for me i've i had both eyes done but in that three week uh, differential when i had one eye done and one eye not it was really vivid you know one was sort of a a, a kind of a warm filter like sunglasses slightly warm the other one was much much cooler relatively yeah. and you know it took maybe three weeks where I really stopped thinking about it actively mm -hmm. and then another three weeks until I completely forgot it. Now, it, you know, everything looks quote normal. Um, yeah. It's all know. in the brain. It's amazing. All it's an amazing. Brain. Yeah, perception in general is a, is, is, is mostly a brain thing. Yeah. So, and exactly. the brain so how is, do we, how plastic. do we get back to the topic? By well, the way, let me, <laughs> let me, let me, let me move, move a bit away from the, from the physiology, <laughs> philosophical sides the, not a physiological to the philosophical sides this way um and just look at some of the challenges when you want to shoot infrared let's go with tech because sure. it's not easy it's it's not simple you can't just point your camera and autofocus and and click it Jeremiah? Shall, we t shall we yeah shall we talk film first because why don't we talk about that uh, sure sure you know in the vault. so um, yes focusing is different because yep. um, what you see is not what you get. You have to adjust. So working in a, uh, a, a deeper depth of field is uh, recommended. Fine focus can be very tricky. You don't want to rely on autofocus, nor can you rely on white balance, though often um, hitting a gray card before you go out is probably a good idea to get your white balance because you'll find it's very hard to grab an absolute white um, so that's, that is one of the very first things that I learned shooting film yeah. in, in terms of, of exposure. And focusing. Okay. So, so you have this, you have this blocking filter on the camera, so you cannot do manual focus because when you look through the viewfinder, all the visible light is blocked out. So, um, you can take that filter off, focus, put that filter on, but then you're still not where you need to be because, um, different wave lights of length 
uh, wavelengths of light get focused at different depths. Yeah. Which is why lenses are so complicated because they have to correct for, otherwise you get chromatic aberration. You get these these uh, color fringing things. That's that's different wavelengths being focused to different depths. Um, yes. So the correct the, the lenses are not made for to correct for uh, for infrared because normally you don't shoot infrared. So there is, um, depending on the kind of infrared filter, that, that will typically come with a correction factor where they say, okay, you have to focus slightly different to make this in focus. Uh, and and then you put the nano. filter back on and then yeah. you yeah. have to yeah. do a lot of math to get the, the exposure right because you are now looking through something that doesn't let a lot of light through, only a very sl thin sliver of the wavelength. So... That will mean will typically mean you have a lot of uh, like a, a lot of long exposures, and then you have to have film stock that can handle that because there's the Schwarzschild effect that will not linearly expose film for longer exposures. So right. we're, we're talking about a whole little uh, a whole little book of um, things to think about, right? Now to avoid those tribulations, it's just easier and you know if you're starting off in this world just use a wide angle lens and yeah. and shoot in the you know towards the uh, middle to back of the f-stop uh, yeah you as know, you said lots of depth of field will help you there absolutely yeah so so that there's an automatic correction uh you know on my lumix i mean it is interchangeable but i, I tend to use a wide angle lens there um and uh white balance is a whole other learning curve um uh, but but when you're shooting film, and I, I, I remember shooting uh, several uh, fashion uh, pieces using, I, th I think it was a infrared slide film. I, it's been a while. I have them in my archive. Um, but they turned out absolutely stunningly beautiful. The skin was purple. Um, I forget what kind of filter I used. But it was sharp. It was beautiful. It was surreal. And it was unusual. And... I don't know if too many manufacturers are still making infrared film. There's infrared slide film. I don't think there's any slide film. No, um, there's any left. No. Negative film, maybe. I certainly haven't um, done a dive on that. Typically, um, in the in the black and white, you will get some infrared films. Yeah, I think but no, but, but that's also one. But, sorry, that's also one reason why a lot of the infrared photography is, is landscape photography, architecture photography, yeah. and. I think I've never seen infrared macro. No, nor have I. Don't I. think well, I have. Again, the f I think the focusing. It's a focusing is, issue. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very uh, difficult. Sorry, um, Adrian. Now, I was going to say uh, I'm not aware of, of any particular products, but actually, um, I Ilford or, or Harman, I should say, uh, make a film or they that called. I think it's called something like SFX, which is a a pseudo infrared film it's a black and white film but it's just a little bit extra sensitive into the infrared so it gets you it gets you a flavor of it but without the the complexity because you, know, you can shoot it just with a, a red filter on it basically um uh, and uh yeah that that um that's a that's a halfway step it's not true infrared photography but it's a halfway well, but, step yeah and there's there's all kinds of post-processing that allows you to emulate somewhat you know what I mean? There, there is ways of uh, inverting the color curve um, <clears throat> when you import it, say, into Photoshop and you look at your histogram and just completely reversing where all the colors are to give you kind of the first dynamic. And then you can replace colors and adjust um, to achieve a look that's quite controllable. Infrared is also a very interesting choice for um, for shooting at times when you would typically not go out and shoot, I'm talking noon, I'm talking lots of sunlight, I'm talking lots of infrared. Um, and even even just a, a film or a camera that has this extended range without the blocking filter, if you go out during the, the high noon, then you will end up with more detail in the shadows because there's a lot of infrared there that the camera then can all of a sudden see so these harsh shadows these harsh contrasts that you get at that time of day um all of a sudden get a lot more definition in the shadows which is uh, another cool aspect of infrared photography also shooting infrared at night is also very interesting 
um, you get very surprising results, especially uh, the difference between urban and rural based on heat and how that affects um, what you see and what's coming off, you know, glass or um, skin uh, is also very interesting, especially in black and white. One could get almost a marble-like texture um, on the surface of skin. Very, very interesting. Um, but again, uh, the exploration of film then gives way to um, a convert converted cameras. Um, and I'm not sure that there are settings for infrared, artificial settings for infrared, though I, I can imagine that you could you could adjust an AI, you could build an AI in a camera to artificially rearrange the spectrum, but it, it, it would be an emulation rather than something that was actually a true visual of, of what we call reality. Um, converting a camera is, is interesting because then, especially full spectrum, which allows the camera to see all, as, as Chris pointed out, of the infrared, uh, quote, light, that's coming off a subject. And then you control what ends up on the chip by different color filters. And they are radically different. I mean, they, they range from sort of a lavender to a deep blue to uh, one that's called candy, which, which is really, really interesting. And um, uh, we'll talk about that in, in a bit. But those filters and experimenting with them really give you sort of the base uh, for importing those into your, um, you know, your editor. Because I think that coming off a digital uh, image of a um, converted camera is really like you get what I'd consider a digital, quote, negative, unquote, that is the beginning of the process. And depending on what filters you use, it's going to look very different. Once you're in Photoshop or, or Neo or, you know, Luminar um, or what, whatever you're using, uh, it's, that's where you have a lot of fun with your colors and histograms and adjustments there to achieve what it is you're looking for or just to experiment with what is possible. And that's a lot of fun. Um, the interesting thing is I'm sure uh, people are selling actions uh, for Photoshop that basically um, make this an automatic process. Um, but but I think that, that the exploration of what color is is something that really yields a lot of benefits once you take a photo, import it, and start to play around uh, with what you would think is subjective, and then you finally realize that all color is subjective, and the the same true same is true of, of black and white in terms of your gradations and your grays and you know also your exposure, um, and 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 that begets a, a, a huge amount of opportunity. Um, so. I, I look at, at this as a step to a lot of elaborate editing um, to achieve, you know, the final result uh, of an image that stands on its own. I think um, I, I have to say, because um, I, I, I'm talking this purely from a theoretical point of view, because I've never actually tried infrared photography, so I am intrigued. But what I've read about it um, is... That there is that there's quite a lot of sophisticated color management in the post processing. If if you're doing color infrared, right, perhaps slightly less if you're doing um, black black and white. But are, are you are you playing around with hues? Are you swapping hues? Are you picking a range, say like the green of the foliage, and saying actually no, that I I wish that to be interpreted in a in a separate way. Yeah. Are you are you choosing color ranges, you know, as a mask and 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 you know, and then changing the, the, the hue of that, or is it, how, how does that work? It's how channel you swapping. That? You, you will, you will yeah, typically swap, swapping. swap a couple of channels. Like you, I, I don't even know. I, I haven't done infrared photography very deeply, but, um, it involves 
switching around things uh, in in yeah. your editor of choice. It's a good teacher. It will teach you a lot of different editing chops. Like you'll you'll, you'll well, know what, more what about exactly. That's one one of the reasons that I, I I kind of brought this up is that the learning curve is both fun. It's not tedious. It's it's a lot of fun to go. Well, what if I move this or identify this color, swap it out for another, invert the curve completely, uh, crush it. And, but you're, you're learning uh, tools that you can apply to what we would consider normal yeah. photography. It and adds more this, tools to your creative toolbox. That, that's right. And, and you start to see, oh, you know, like I don't like that qu that shade of blue i like it blue but i don't like exactly how vivid it is you can make a luminosity mask and dial it back but it really helps define the relationship between effectively color subjective color adjusted color um, and final result. And then of course if you're going to print it there's yet another um, hoop <laughs> <laughs> to, to jump through. Um, but, but, but it is something that I, I highly recommend, uh, as a, um, as a learning tool. It'd be interesting to see if just infrared film is available in any, in any way for people just to pick up, um, a roll, you know, put on a blue filter or a red filter or, you know, one of the many, and just experiment, you know, bracket your exposures, uh, bracket even your focusing, uh, your depth of field, move it into your editor and start to play. You're going to learn a lot and have fun with it. And there's also plenty of videos about it. So it's, it's yeah. easy to find good information. Yes. Yeah. Well, how about, <laughs> how, how about a, an infrared group shot? Not sure we can sit still enough, long enough for that. Can we do that? <laughs> do we have the power? Do we have the technology? Not really. Oh, we may. Not oh, remote. Okay. Not remote. Not remote. Not remote. Well, so, you know, so this is your it. this is your converted camera. This is my converted camera. Uh, obviously, um, it's. Um, it looks stylish, you know the, the 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 blue lens. It's kind of a hippie glasses kind of feel. Yes, so this, this lens. This is the uh, IR Chrome. It's, it's it's supposed to be it's considered the kind of strong man <laughs> of it gives you the most opportunity in post now you know if i flip it around I'll, what, what does it do when you shoot a picture off the screen this is what what it looks like a lot of magenta in Hold the picture on. i'm just like uh you're not, you're not showing the picture now. You're showing. Oh, I'm not. Wait a second. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. I'm sure. There it is. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Pink. So but but you can't really see blues. how vividly um, red it is. I mean, it's red. Um, and and a, a computer screen is not your ideal subject. Mm, of course not, because it's it's a it's self self a self lighting thing and not a reflective kind of thing. So, so it, it t takes a lot of the blue of the screen and converts it to red, and then you know all the rest of it. Um, so, so, so just just let me ask a few questions. How does that work then? So you've got a, a camera where the, your your sensor in the camera is sensitive to a wider range of frequencies yeah. than usual right yeah. including extending into the infrared yes you've then put a blue filter i think it was a blue filter that yeah. is as long as the colors are from your video feed are coming through okay you've got a blue filter on that so a blue filter will only allow blue light through is that right is it a blue filter it's not exactly a blue filter. No, it's it, it's more on the on the purple end. It it has to be right. more on the infrared. But no, actually, it has to block visible light or part of the visible light. See if you right. Yeah, maybe you get a sense of it. It's not pure blue. You can see a little uh, green in and there. And the camera, the white balance in your camera changes everything anyway. So it's exactly. really hard to show here. Um, and it's. The thing is with infrared photography, it's a very nuanced kind of thing that has a lot of possibilities. So by the choice of the filter, you decide what goes onto the sensor, what goes yeah. and what stays off the sensor. So the uh, take 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 an old uh, an old TV remote. They have this black 
piece of plastic on it, which is in fact translucent to infrared. But if you hold it in front of your eye, you don't see anything through it because it blocks the visible light and there's little infrared LED in it that can shine through that. And that's something similar, but with uh, with lots of variation, lots of nuance, different kinds of filters will do different kind of blocking and lighting through. So you decide by using the filter and by opening up the sensor to more of the of the bandwidth of the and spectrum. And let's not forget uh, white balance because that, and then white know, balance changes everything again in the, di in the digital RAM. It's easier to do in film, or let's no, nah, maybe not easier, but it is. It's more straightforward to do it. It's in film. more stable in film. Yes. Um, yes. But if you're going to shoot uh, with infrared, I highly like some cameras will have a built in gray card, but even that doesn't work on a converted camera. So what you really need to do is carry a gray card and take your automatic white balance from it in that light. And then you at least have a neutral start position. Um, right, so you so you take a photo of the grey card in the normal way, and then when you get back to post production, you can say that that's what that color is. Well, you like this camera, and you know ma many of them have a um, the ability to apply a grey card to a standard. Um, white oh, balance right. okay. adjustment. So you, so you, so, you say you know, this the, is, I'm shooting a great, yes, and it helps you set a custom white balance in your camera. That That's it. It's a custom right, white okay. balance. And even moving the kind of Kelvin numbers, they don't really help. <laughs> it gets more confusing there anyway. But Lord Kelvin but, would be quite upset about that. He, he kind of invented be. that whole thing. Half of Glasgow is built out of the money you made out of inventing that kind of thing. <laughs> and then after you have played with it for long enough you'll get to take pictures like like these yes. with um what we call the wood effect which is a it's a, it's a, a where, where foliage green trees and meadows look like look white and they have a very different kind of feeling to them so um it yields some really surreal kind of out outcomes so yeah, it's definitely cool i like it yeah all right. Enough. So next about week, Jeremiah, you'll have to that. share with us a couple of photos that you because if you've just picked it up this morning and you go out for a walk late, or whatever, share us a couple of photos in in the TFOP gallery, and we'll. we'll have uh, I, next I will. Week. I will, and, and I may try and dig out uh, some of my early infrared that are you know languishing in my archive up there. So, so one last question, because I know it's probably going to move on to Picks of the Week shortly, but one last question. If I don't have a converted camera, is there a way I can sort of pseudo play with, with these ideas? Yes and no. There are emulations that are available. I know that uh, there are videos how to achieve the infrared look. But they're very labor intensive because you really have to adjust color by color everything. Now I've done this. I've emulated uh, orthofilm. I did a, a. It's in fact it's on my website. The folio is called Blackland, and the skies are black. The mountains and the snow are white. They're landscape uh, photographs that they're almost ortho or infrared, somewhere in between. But but they were all done manipulated in post. I shot them with a ah, normal okay. camera. Um, normal film camera and converted them and 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 really did sort of a deep dive in in editing them and printing them um so there yes there is a way but but uh, i would do a do a, a search and see if you could find some infrared film and pick up a filter that's probably the easiest way i'm not if there's an old camera that you have lying around um they have one or two you know what i mean i i think those are depending on you know, cost, but I, you know, and I don't know who does it locally in Britain. There's usually a few places that do it in each country um, and have it converted because it's, it's a nice bit of kit to have. Um, again, if you're just, if it's just a, a boat anchor of a camera sitting on a shelf, um, the, I, I don't think the Pixel strength is that important, and and nowadays, you know, we we did talk about this last week a bit uh, that moving a sort of a a, a lower um, pixel count 
image to a emulated high with gigapixel or a multiple multiplex of different softwares to achieve a, a kind of a larger print is now very much possible. So I don't think we're that restricted. Also, at this time, a lot of people might have an old DSLR in their on their shelf somewhere that's collecting dust right. because they swap to a mirrorless system and um, Google for conversion uh, co companies that do infrared conversions because um, they will often list the type of cameras or the specific models that they that are easy to convert and there's a there's a chance that someone has this old camera and it's like yeah I'm not really using it anymore and maybe the the, the camera will get a second life by having a conversion so. Um, on to the picks, because uh, Jeremiah's pick is straight from, straight, the, straight from the infrared world. You have uh, a, a, the, the candy chrome filter, the one that you just showed us. Um, and here's an introduction to it and some conversion uh, techniques. Yeah, this is a very interesting site. Also, Kalari does conversions and, and they're, they're, you know, they sell um, all manner of filters. Very, very... Uh, High quality, you can read this about using channel swapping, creating LUTs in your Lightroom, uh, what each of these will look like, um, how to kind of bring out the best. So it's it's not something that is difficult to learn. And it's it's a, a lot, you can just follow along with it. And you don't need a lot of gear, but um, it really does give you a, an amazing sense of the subjectivity of reality. Um, Certainly which, does. Which, of course, is where I live. In that All place. right. Um, my pick is along the lines of film, and it is about Harman, the, the, the company behind Ilford and other films and papers, because um, that's relatively breaking news they have uh, announced that they're making a huge investment in film manufacturing um i think several millions uh, yeah. in their in their what's the what's the Press site release. again moberly yeah. um yeah. which is their i guess their 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 home base yeah it is they said they their manufacturing plant moberly it's in um cheshire uh, uh the sort of northwest of england not far yeah. from liverpool and they and they are they're investing in new machinery in uh, new techniques and things. They're modernizing their film manufacturing, uh, which is a good sign. I mean, a company you've you've seen over the last I think since film was pronounced dead, you've seen a lot of um, companies using their old machines or buying old machines from other companies, um, building new machines for film processing. I think that's a first since. I don't know, around 2000 maybe. Is the Phoenix is the Phoenix film by Harman is that um, produced on these new machines? No, it's not. It's still on older <laughs> equipment. But they are they're now investing um, because they're yeah because because they see a future in film yes, and yeah. it's cool. And uh, that's and, great. And that's fantastic news. I know Harman didn't n nearly didn't make it through the death of film. Um, uh, yeah, as an organization that, yeah, they, they very much struggled. So actually to have them now strong enough to be investing in new manufacturing equipment is fantastic. It's an amazing, analog yeah. to that, no pun or very much a pun intended. An analog to that is, um, LPs, vinyl outsold CDs this year. <laughs> Did that. Which is is this due to the to the resurgence of LPs or due to due to the death of CDs? Probably both a bit, right? I, I think both, both yeah. and, and also the you know the rise of Taylor Swift. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, but, I hear people but, are listening to cassettes now as well, which I, I I haven't gone back to. I don't think I have a cassette player anymore. Oh, there are yeah. artists, Adrian, that are only working in a track. I, st me. <laughs> I still have some old mixtapes. Mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> All right. Um, last but not least, Adrian, you brought us a gallery. 
Hmm. Uh, yeah, particularly actually a show. So this is the Saatchi Gallery uh, in London. Many people, I'm sure, listening to the podcast will know the name. Uh, they have an exhibition on at the moment called Beyond Fashion, which is a collection of a, a from a, a range of artists uh, and a range of time periods. But it's a um, it's very much the I don't know would you call it the avant garde fashion photography scene. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, very high end cultural advertisements. This is not your, um, you know, um, buy a sausage roll from the baker's kind of advert. This is fashion stuff and, and um, conceptual stuff, uh, all sorts of things going on. So, yeah, um, it runs, I think, for another couple of months. Um, so anybody who can get to London to see it, you know, um, I'm going to try and get some tickets myself. Looking good. That looks great. Looks looks absolutely great. Awesome. I like that. Infrared there? Any infrared there? I don't know. I haven't been yet. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, um, that brings us to the end of this episode. Infrared. I'm getting, like, I, I do have a few uh, rolls of infrared film, which I have used in the past without an, an infrared, without a visible light blocker on it. So to and extend, those are nice too. To, to really extend nice the too, range yeah. that is visible on black and white, that's a pretty cool thing, especially when you're shooting at noon. So anyway, that is it for today. We are the future of photography. We are online. Um, talk to us in our Discord. That's a good place if you have done any infrared photography to let us know. What yeah, you've definitely done. good to see it. Yeah, we'll be back pictures. in a week from now. Until then, everyone, take care and see you. Bye. You've been listening to the future of photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Hold up. 